Good morning, Bethel family. How are we doing today? Ah, oh, that was a little bit poor. How are we doing today, guys? That's a lot better. Hey, would you guys stand with me? We're about ready to start some worship. But before we do, uh, I just wanted to say, dude, worship is so great. We get to praise God just through our storms. We get that, that opportunity. We don't have to do any of this. And that's what makes worship so great. It's because we get to praise God. And if you don't believe me, there's a verse on the screen that we're going to read together. And it just talks about just praising God through whatever we're doing. So if you guys would read with me, it says, Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's worship today. King of all kings is still on his throne. Whoa. 
in Jesus' name, Lord. We just, we praise the King of Kings, the name above all names, Lord. We invite you into the service, Lord, for Pastor Adam's message, Lord, that the words have life spoken onto them, spoken through us, that we can receive it. And anything that we brought in, Lord, we just leave it at the door, Lord, just to receive you and your fullness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for worshiping, guys. Hey, we're gonna greet one another. We're just gonna take a minute of doing that. And you can say hi, but also, if you're feeling a little energetic, tell somebody about like your favorite spring activity that's going on since it's spring. Good morning, everyone. If you can take a seat, that would be great. My name is Sarah Landon. Sundays, you might find me in the David Room hanging out with kindergartners. Tuesdays at Women's Bible Study, and maybe even during the week on your smartphone doing a podcast. And my name is Andy Landon, and unless you're under 12, you probably don't recognize me because I spend almost all my time over in the kids' wing. Lately, I've been in the DZ Auditorium teaching our third through fifth graders about Jesus. So, hey, if you are new here, we would love to get to know you a little bit better. Um, oh, because I forgot to say my last line. Hey, in addition to that, we have three kids. We have an elementary schooler, a middle schooler, and a high schooler. Um, so yes, we are pretty much busy all the time, and I am tired all the time. <laughs> now the new person thing. If you're new here, we would love to meet you, and there's a couple different ways you could do that. If you're an extrovert like me, you can wander out into the foyer after service and say hello to one of our friendly people at the welcome booth. They can answer pretty much any question you might have. And if you're an introvert like me, you will skip the welcome booth because that requires talking to people. But we do have a QR code that you can scan that'll do the same thing. But if you do go out there and meet somebody, um, just for being bold and introducing yourself and giving your name, we will give to the, one of our local partners uh, just for being bold like that. This week is our small group, or sorry, last week was our small group kickoff. But this week, those small groups begin. And it's not too late to join. Um, small groups have been at the heart of my most deep personal growth here at Bethel. And I don't know about you, but I also need structure in order to make that happen. So a date in the calendar or a planned Bible study. So to do that, we have Rooted. It's a great way to kick things off. We also have men's and women's Bible studies, as well as the Bethel Institute class. This um, season, we're going through the big picture story of the Bible together. And there's a bunch of other small groups otherwise. So um, let me see. Uh, yes. So if you're curious about small groups, we will have some tables out in the foyer and people who can answer your questions or all the information will be on our website, Bethel.ch or in the Church Center app. Hey, one other way that we can build community is through giving. And you'll see on the screen there's a bunch of different ways that, that you can do that. But I kind of wanted to talk about the heart of the giving and at least what my heart does when I give. And I know that my heart becomes tied to wherever I'm giving to. And that when I'm giving to my local community, my heart becomes softened for the people around me and for my local community. And when you give through the church, you join the mission of the church. And one of the initiatives that we have through Bethel is called the 3630, where our goal was to reach just 1% of our region uh, in the name of Christ. And as part of the 3630, last summer, we launched our West Pasco comp campus as Imago Dei Community Church. Actually, one of our rooted families that we know have been right in the thick of that. So we've been praying for them and cheering them on as they, as we partner with, um, they partner with what Bethel is doing to share the gospel in West Pasco. And this morning, we have an update from Dave Stevanis about Imago Dei. So check out the screen. We launched Imago Day on August 1st, and we meet Sunday mornings at, uh, at 9.30 over at the Fairchild Cinema, which is interesting to meet in a theater. There's a lot of setup that has to be done, but we've got great people that come in early in the morning, get us all set up and ready to go. 
Yeah, Imago Dei Community Church is really focused on community. We have a high degree of volunteer involvement, and we need that to make church happen on Sunday morning. And then our small groups have continued to be a big part of the church. A lot of those were established before, but they continue to be an integral part of, of who we are and building that community during the week. God has blessed us with a really incredible team of people who are using their gifts and talents to shepherd people, to teach people, to kind of deepen the bench where nobody's getting burned out with all that setup and all the things to do. And one of the fun things that happened uh, for us last summer, not too long after we got established, was to do baptisms. And we did that in a horse trough on a trailer in the parking lot on one of those 100 degree Tri-City days. Uh, we tried to get the water as warm as possible, but I heard it was a little bit cold. But uh, we baptized about a half dozen people, kids and adults, and that was cool. That was a cool time of uh, coming together, seeing new life, and people celebrating that. You know, back at the old campus, we started this thing called the fellowships. You know, that was something Adam and I kind of had an idea years ago, it seems like. It's a potluck and, and people just ar around the table talking and enjoying the community. Uh, we do it right there at the theater now. We do it in the lobby at the theater. We roll tables in, ask people to bring chairs. Uh, they bring food. And every time we have one of those, people are just blown away by just the, the sense of community that we have at Imago. You, you could see where we came from and everything that we do, but you could also see that we're getting used to the fact that we, we are a small church and we're not connected to a larger church anymore. One kind of funny story is our business license. We, we uh, applied for all these licenses and things we had to do. And then we got some information from a very reliable source that we would never have that in time. Joe Sapp, the guy that's doing all that stuff for us, uh, he, he was sweating. And I just told him one day, I said, Joe, you know what? We will have it right before we need it. And uh, sure enough, with, within a few weeks, Right, really before we had to file some paperwork and open bank accounts and do all that stuff, we got our business license. And I, and I just told him, I said, hey, God's got us covered. He says, that's why you're the pastor. Yeah, one of the challenges was to come up with a budget. We, we set a giving budget when we started and we found out pretty early that we made a mistake. We, we did not see how, how generous God's people would be to Imago Day. God's directing people with their money and their talents and their gifts, and people are pouring them into the church. The giving has just exceeded the budget that we set every month. And so that has been really reassuring to know that people aren't just coming because they thought it would be a fun place to go, but they're committed. They're committed to serve and they're committed with their finances as well. Giving has exceeded our expectations, but I think that's because people are finding a home. They, they're finding a, a church home that they love to be in. They have trust in the leadership and they just love being with the other people. So uh, that's a good thing. And, and everybody's feeling this sense that, you know, God is moving here. We get to preach the gospel every week and we get to see people come and we get to love on them and we get to try to help them, you know, kind of find their place. In, in the kingdom, and that's just cool. Do we have a permanent home, or is a theater a place that we hang out for a while? I've heard several people mention, you know, I really enjoy being in the theater. And it is a welcoming place. Uh, several people have invited friends who may not grace the doors of a church on a Sunday morning, but they'll certainly go to a theater because they're comfortable being there. When all this started, it, it seemed like a, a tumultuous uproar. I mean, there was a lot of turmoil, and, and not to say it was easy, but Bethel started us out well a long time ago. You know, being part of Bethel is our DNA. We, we really were a church plant by Bethel. And I feel like Bethel has just generously supported us at the get-go and, and even now. I don't ever want to forget where we came from, but I also want everybody to know that Bethel's um, support and generosity didn't just stop when we started. It continues to go on, and, and I'm thankful for that. It's a real blessing to have that. Let's, let's pray for West Pasco Imago Day right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this awesome report from Dave and Derek. Lord, the way that you are on the move just over the river, several miles uh, in a church that um, you love and that you're working through. Lord, we want to lift up 
uh, the work that they're doing, both the leaders and the, the staff and the congregation to be your people in West Pasco and to reach out to that community there. And Lord, we pray your continued blessing on them. Uh, Lord, even this morning as they meet, we pray that you would be working in their midst uh, to grow that body, Lord, to bring new people into the kingdom, Lord, and to bless that work. So thank you for uh, the part that we get to play in, in that church. Lord, and we pray that you continue to put Imago Day on our hearts to pray for them and care for them and uh, encourage them in ways that we can. So Lord Jesus, thank you for that. Thank you for this opportunity to gather here in this building in Richland today as well. Thank you for um, the work you're doing here and for the people you've brought in the doors today to, to worship and hear your voice. So we pray as we open your word, would you speak? Would you give us humility and an openness to hear what you want us to hear this morning? And uh, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts this morning would be pleasing in your sight, our rock and redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name for his glory alone. Amen. All right, well, thanks for coming again to, to Bethel. Uh, if we've not met, my name is Adam Phillips. I get the privilege of being the lead pastor here. And we have been working through this thing called the Sermon on the Mount the last five weeks. And uh, this is Jesus' most famous sermon, most challenging sermon, and uh, I hope that you've been challenged so far. Uh, if you're joining with us for the first time, that is okay. You can jump right in with us. Uh, Jesus is talking about real life stuff that mattered 2,000 years ago and still matters today because Jesus intends for us to live in the world, not just as individual Christians, but as his kingdom people. And this sermon is a condensed version of Jesus's vision for his kingdom people in the world. And if you're here and you're a new Christian or you're a mature Christian or you're curious about Christianity, this is our marching orders as Christians, our constitution for the kingdom. So there's a lot here for everybody, and uh, I hope it's encouraging for us this morning. I will say from the beginning, and I think I've said this every time I've preached from this passage so far, this is a challenging one. The Sermon on the Mount is challenging, and it should be challenging. And today, Jesus takes us into some topics that are sensitive, challenging, and will send us out here with something to wrestle with this week for sure. Uh, Jesus uh, is moving in this sermon into a new section that uh, James started last week where Jesus talks about his intent to live out a righteous life and for his people to live out a righteous life. He says this, I want to just review from last week in Matthew 5, verse 17 through 20. And, and sort of the context here is there are people who believe in the time of Jesus that he doesn't care about the law of Moses he doesn't care about righteousness and being uh, someone that reflects God. He's coming in and he's disrupting things and he's, he's trying to lead people astray. Jesus clarifies that. He says, that's not what I'm doing. He says, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. He's talking about that large section of our scriptures called the Old Testament. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get in to the kingdom of God. Now, there's a lot that we could say there. Uh, one of those things could be that that righteousness that surpasses the scribes and the Pharisees is a righteousness that's not just about external obedience. It's a changed heart. He's saying, unless your heart is changed, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but I do think that it's possible for us to say, to distill what Jesus is saying, that Jesus cares about righteousness. Uh, if you look around at Christians throughout the world, if you look at your own life, you can see that we wrestle with doing what is right. And there are Christians that might tell you that God doesn't really care about the way you live because he forgives you, he shows you grace, now just live your life. But Jesus makes it clear in this sermon, he wants his kingdom people to live righteously in the world. He cares about righteousness for himself, but he also cares about our righteousness. In fact, the apostle Peter says that Jesus died on the cross so that we might learn and know what it, lives, uh, what it looks like to live righteously. He says, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, so us having died in Christ to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So that's a challenge for us this morning. Jesus 
despite what we might think at times or want at times, cares that we live righteously. Now, I want to make a couple of clarifications at the beginning because that word righteous and righteousness can maybe conjure up different ideas in our mind that may not be accurate. Uh, when I say righteousness, uh, what I don't mean by that is being self-righteous. All of us have been self-righteous at times. We all probably know a Christian or two who are self-righteous, which is basically this attitude of, hey, I do good things and I'm morally upright and I feel really good about myself. And you should feel really good about how righteous I am. Jesus isn't saying he wants self-righteous people. He doesn't need any more self-righteous people in the kingdom. So that's not what we're talking about. Uh, Jesus is also not talking about being saved by your works. It does not mean that. It's not this idea of you get God's grace when you do good things. And if you do good things, you get God's grace. If you don't do good things, God takes away his grace. It's this idea of working for salvation. Jesus is not saying that in this sermon at all. What he means by righteousness is living in right relationship with God and with people. Like righteousness has this real tangible flesh around it that as we are changed by Jesus, it begins to change our relationships with other people. We are living right with all people. Believers, unbelievers, friends, enemies, all the people we encounter in the world, we are doing right by them. That's what Jesus is talking about. He wants his kingdom people to live in the world in a way that looks like God and puts the light of God on the world. And today we get to look at three different things that Jesus talks about that looks like being righteous in our lives. So he's going to talk about three, and they're, they're all, uh, to some degree, pretty challenging. So I hope we can buckle up here, jump in. I just want to say from the beginning that Jesus who calls us to this greater righteousness is also a God and a king who does show grace, who loves us and sticks with us as we are wrestling with him and uh, running and falling and getting back up. And so the words of Jesus are hard and challenging, but remember, he is also a God who loves you and wants to see you grow and wants to show you his grace. Okay, so if we want to live righteously in the world as Jesus' disciples, it's going to look like guarding our thoughts, guarding our thoughts. Righteousness is, according to Jesus, not just about what we do with our hands or physically in ways that people can see, but righteousness also includes our thought lives, the things that are going on in secret in our minds that no one else can see except for us and God. And Jesus jumps right in talking about adultery in verse 27 of chapter 5. He says this, you have heard that it was said, and he quotes from the Old Testament law, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, it is true, Jesus is speaking specifically to men here who are lusting after women, but I have been reminded time and again that lust is not just a man, a man thing, it's also a female thing. I remember talking about lust with a group of high schoolers when I was a youth pastor back in the day, and a girl leader came up and said, hey, you know, you're kind of talking about like it's just a guy thing. Uh, it, it includes everybody. So Jesus' words are directed at men, but they, they relate to everybody. And what he's saying here is that according to Jesus, adultery is not just a physical act. Adultery is a physical act, but it's not limited to that. Adultery is also something that happens in our minds and in our hearts, in the secretness of who we are, without the consent of the person uh, that we're fantasizing about. And what Jesus does here is he simplifies the command of adultery. Because what's going on is people, we do this all the time as well, we can take a law and we can look at it and say, well, I didn't really do that. And we can sidestep it and sort of avoid the heart of the law. And so people are like, well, I mean, I, I've never actually committed the act of adultery, so it doesn't really matter what's going on inside of my heart. And Jesus is like, no, the original intent of the law was not just to make you externally obedient. It was to change you and your heart at the center of who you are. That you wouldn't commit adultery in the act, but you also would be on guard for the way that your mind is working in those thoughts about other people. So Jesus is, yes, on the one hand, he's setting boundaries to protect marriage. He does not want people to commit adultery and to destroy a marriage bond that's been created. But Jesus also wants to limit the, the amount of things that we will do in our mind and think that it's okay that we're doing it. So Jesus is saying that righteousness will look like not only restraining from physical adultery, but also keeping ourselves from secretly consuming other people 
into our private fantasies. That's, that's what Jesus is saying here. Because this is what happens when we think about lust. Lust creates this world that no one knows about except for, for us, where human beings, the opposite sex, begins to exist not as human beings with dignity and worth and value, but someone that I can consume and become uh, an object for me to take into my life and use as I want. And what happens in lust is the person may not know you're lusting, but you're, you're sinning against them without them knowing. And what happens is it begins to degrade the way that we view human beings. Because when you start to view human beings, whether it's through lust or greed or whatever, as just people to be used, someone to be consumed into me, then our view of humans become less. Our ability to love becomes less. Our ability to truly, genuinely live with other people becomes difficult when they are objects for our pleasure. And so Jesus is saying, hey, living right with other people, yes, it's gonna include not intruding in marriages with adultery, but it's gonna include you guarding your own heart and mind so that you don't begin to see people as someone to be consumed into your fantasies. So Jesus is calling us to both thinking and living in a way that reflects him. Now, I want to make a couple clarifications here about lust because it's kind of a big category and I want to make sure we understand exactly what we're talking about. Lust, it, I don't believe it's the same thing as recognizing beauty. God created human beings, God created beauty. And so to recognize that someone uh, is an image bearer and is beautiful is not lust, okay? Uh, to have the initial thought of lust, to have that temptation, isn't necessarily the sin of lust. Here's what lust is. Lust is when you take that thought of beauty and you tra track that thought down and you lose control of it. And you start to think about things and imagine things and fantasize about things about that person that you shouldn't. It's taking a thought of beauty and then running with it and letting it become something that you obsess about. And again, this is something that men and women do. Uh, I think every human being is tempted in this way. And Jesus is saying, you need to be aware of it because living righteously is guarding your thoughts when it comes to other human beings and sex. Righteousness is gonna look like being on guard of our actions and our thoughts, which what this will happen when we do this. We will be led to a greater love and respect for other human beings, especially for the other sex. Uh, even just speaking here to men, uh, when we can take captive our thoughts and begin to respect women for who they are and the dignity they have outside of what they might bring us in pleasure, then we begin to see them as true human beings who are worthy and valuable in God's sight and begin to love women in a way that they deserve. And Jesus says, if we want to live this way, it's gonna take extreme measures. Living a life of righteousness is not gonna happen if you just sit back and hope that God's just gonna change you. It takes God changing and us joining God to do the work to kill sin. Listen to what Jesus says, the extreme measures. Uh, he says in verse 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, doesn't say close it. He says, gouge it out, throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Okay, Jesus is, he's being serious here. He's saying, I'm not kidding. You need to fight and battle sin. Now, I believe that Jesus, he does this a lot when he talks, is being hyperbolic. He's, he's using an extreme example to communicate a point, right? Um, he wants us to take extreme measures to fight sin. There have been people in church history that have literally cut off body parts in obedience to Jesus. I don't personally believe that Jesus is actually calling us to do that, but he's calling us to do whatever it takes to fight sin. John Owen was a theologian several centuries ago. He said this about sin, mortify, kill, make it your daily work. Be always at it while you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. I think Jesus is saying something similar here. Whatever it takes, remove the stumbling. When it comes to lust, 
in your own personal life, remove whatever it takes, whatever the cost is, whatever the sacrifice is to remove that from your life. For some of you, that might be limiting the amount of movies and shows you watch and the kind of movies and shows that you watch. If they lead you to stumble, to think about things in your mind that you shouldn't be thinking about, stop watching them. Uh, Social media might be something where it exposes you to images or thoughts that lead you just to cause you to stumble and to lust after other people. If that's you, limit it. If for you, the internet is a hard thing to control because when you're on the internet, it leads you to click on something and to click on something else and the privacy of your own home or on your phone, you find yourself stumbling into sexual sin. Limit your access to the internet. There are wonderful tools online uh, where you can bring accountability partners who can see your search history and keep you accountable. That will feel like death. That will feel humiliating. It will be challenging. But it's this extreme measure Jesus is talking about to live righteously when it comes to our thoughts. It's just generally a good rule in your life, men and women, to have people that can keep you accountable, who you can talk to about your struggles and your failures, who can pray for you, help pick you back up and encourage you. All of those things will be difficult to do, but those are the kind of extreme measures that allow us to live in righteousness with our thoughts. Okay, so righteousness will look like guarding your thoughts. Here's another one. If you are married, righteousness is going to look like being committed. If you're married, righteousness will look like being committed. Before we jump too far into what Jesus says here, I do want to say one thing because I think it's important for those in the church who are not married or who are thinking about not getting married. I want to say this, that um, righteousness in the kingdom does not require marriage. There are sometimes this assumption in the evangelical church that marriage somehow equals, you know, being a better disciple, being more effective in the kingdom, that if you're not married, you're somewhat incomplete in your growth in Christ. I don't know where that came from, but that's sort of a common assumption. And I think the single people maybe in our body or in Christian bodies around the world feel that maybe more than than you do if you're married. But there are examples of people in the scriptures, Jesus and Paul, and a number of saints throughout the history of the church who have remain single for the kingdom. And God has used it and God loves their sacrifice for his kingdom. In fact, Jesus talks about this and Paul does in the scripture when the disciples are like, man, Jesus, like what you're saying about marriage is too hard. Maybe we just shouldn't get married. Listen to what Jesus says. Matthew 19, he says, not everyone can accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their, from their mother's room. There are, are womb, sorry. There are eunuchs who are made by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves that way because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who is able to accept it should accept it. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, I say to the unmarried and to the widow, it is good for them if they remain as I am, not married. But if they do not have self-control, they should marry, since it is better to marry than to burn with desire. So I just want to say this because I don't want to to leave us with the assumption that righteousness somehow means you have to be married. If you are being called to singleness, man, the Lord can use you in incredible ways in his kingdom. I remember in seminary, a pastor came and talked to us, a single guy in his 40s who said, there are things that I can do that no one else can do when they're married as pastors because I have the schedule to do it. And he was telling us, hey, you're married, you can't change that. But I'm just going to tell you, if you're not married, you can think about the way the Lord might use you in your singleness. And that was an interesting kind of rearranging of my mental furniture and thinking about marriage. Okay, so you don't have to be married, but marriage is good. And if you are married, Jesus calls you to a deep fidelity and loyalty and commitment to the person that you married. Jesus calls us to a deep faithfulness. He says this, um, And and he's talking in the context of like marriage and divorce. And he says this in Matthew 5, 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in a case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Okay, so just from the start here, this again is a large passage that we could preach a number of sermons on and probably should someday. I can't say everything, but I do want us to understand what Jesus is saying so we can understand what it means for us. Um, 
it's important for us to know that Jesus, as he's speaking here, he is speaking into a context that most of us probably don't know. And I didn't know it until I researched it. Um, he's not just saying this in a vacuum or out of the blue. He's speaking into a context and a debate happening at the time of his life in the first century. And, and the debate was over a passage in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 24, where Moses gives uh, a caveat for people to get divorced. And there's this phrase in Matthew 24 that says this, if a man marries a woman, but she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, he can give her a certificate of divorce. And there was debate over, well, what, what exactly constitutes something that's displeasing and indecent? And there were two schools, main schools of thought on what that meant. And I'll put the name up here if you want to research later. It's the houses of Hillel and the house of Shammai. Okay, these were two rabbinic schools, Jewish rabbis who had two different interpretations around what it means uh, that a man can divorce over some indecency that is displeasing. And women, I'm just going to warn you, uh, one of these guys is going to make you want to throw up in your mouth. Okay, so Hillel took more of the liberal view of what this might mean. He found ways to stretch it for people uh, in such a way that what it means to find something indecent or displeasing can really be anything. In fact, it can be if the wife burns dinner and you find that displeasing, that is a warrant for you to divorce your wife, okay? Man, that is not great advice, not a good reason. And I think that in the Old Testament, you can even see some of this, this working out in the life of Israelite men where they are leaving the wives of their youth for a number of different reasons, and God hates it. And so in the prophet Malachi, he He's telling them, hey, I'm not listening to your prayers. I'm not responding to your sacrifices. And you might ask, why? Well, because even though the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, you have acted treacherously against her. She was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. Um, verse, the next couple of verses says, if, if he hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel, he covers his garment with injustice, says the Lord of armies. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously. We don't know all the context going on in the first century, but it is clear enough that there was some level of understanding among Israelite men that they could divorce women and not be super committed for whatever reason they wanted. And it would leave women in difficult situations where now in their culture, they're not married and they don't have the rights and they don't have the resources they need and the man can just go marry whoever he wants. Okay, that's the house of Hillel. There's also the house of Rabbi Shammai, who held that the only reason a man could divorce his wife is if she commits adultery against him. She takes, he takes the more narrow view that calls men to fidelity and commitment with their wives unless the most drastic thing happens. Jesus is siding with Shammai. I hope that's clear through his words. And calling men specifically in this passage to a higher level of commitment and to marriage than was practiced at the time. Now again, we need to apply this to both men and women, Jesus is calling us to a greater level of faithfulness in our relationships. In fact, righteousness will look like being committed in your marriage, working on yourself, loving your spouse, sticking it out through every season with the person that you made a marriage vow with. Even when those little annoyances turn into bigger disagreements, when your interests change, when your bodies change, when the spark dims when there are seasons you go through like why did I marry this person in those moments in those seasons Jesus calls his people to a greater righteousness to live right by the person that we have vowed in marriage vowed ourselves to so a couple applications here if you are thinking about leaving over one of those things right frustrated just kind of done you've changed you've grown apart I would encourage you to stop and consider getting help, to consider Jesus' words. And I want to recognize in this too that there, there are reasons and times where divorce is the better option. If there's abuse or abandonment and other things, that's, that's a very delicate topic. Uh, but if those things aren't happening, you're just growing tired of the person you're married to. They're not changing at the level that you want to. They're not interesting to you anymore. Please consider getting help. Uh, if you are a spouse and your spouse is begging you to change, begging you to go to counseling, begging you to get help, I would encourage you this morning to listen and to do it. Especially if you're here and you're a disciple of Jesus and your spouse is begging you to get help and to change. 
I, I believe that Jesus in this passage is begging you to get help. So please do that. Uh, this has been something that I've been learning. I've been married for almost 15 years, which is nothing to compare, compare to most of you, but marriage was not created to fulfill you and me. Okay, that's not what marriage is for. Marriage is to fulfill God's purpose in you and your spouse. Okay, that's a, maybe a, a slight distinction that doesn't make sense. Let me put it this way. Marriage does not exist for you to get all the things that you want or for me to get all the things I want. Marriage exists because it's from God to change us and grow us and make us more like God, to transform us and teach us how to sacrifice and how to live in a way that looks like God. Uh, there was an illustration a pastor used at a wedding one time that I thought was fabulous. Um, if you've ever worked with rocks and used a rock tumbler, I have not. My grandfather did that with agates and had just like paint buckets full of agates growing up. But you put these rocks inside a tumbler with chemicals and all these things, and the rocks just sit and they vibrate against each other, and they're working to shave off the rough spots, and it becomes something that's pure, and it looks beautiful by the end of it. But it takes a lot of friction and heat and rubbing against each other. This pastor said, that's kind of what marriage is. It's not easy. Whoever tells you marriage is easy, they're lying. Marriage is hard. And it's good that it's hard because it's not there to fulfill you. It's there to change you, to transform you, to make you more like Jesus. And so when marriage gets hard because there's sin and there's transformation that needs to happen, as a Christian, you can lean into it and say, hey, this is hard. We need help. But we can be hopeful that Jesus is going to do something beautiful in this. So if you're married, be committed. Righteousness will look like you living right by the person that you have married. In easy seasons and hard seasons and sickness and in health, stick with it. Um, again, I want to acknowledge that there are other things that may break marriage bonds outside of sexual immorality. And one of the things that we have to know about this passage is that Jesus is not giving like a full-fledged theology of marriage and divorce. I wish he did that in the scriptures, but he doesn't. He is sp speaking specifically to a debate, and we have to recognize that. And we have to listen to Jesus in other places and listen to Jesus speaking through other authors in the scripture to really understand God's whole heart when it comes to specific issues of marriage and not use a passage like this to tell people to stay in marriages that might be violent or, or harmful for them to stay in. And I also want to say this. If you have been divorced, I know this is a hard passage to hear. Jesus has a future for you. Jesus has grace for you. I think of two stories in the scripture. One, the woman at the well. And sometimes we kind of assume the woman at the well must have been like a harlot. She had five husbands. She's living with someone that's not her husband. And she must have just been super immoral. Well, we don't actually know. It's possible that she was widowed. It's possible that she was the victim of a guy being like, I don't find you decent anymore. I'm going to divorce you. And maybe there's some sexual morality in her part as well. We don't really know. But what we do know is that when Jesus sees her, he changes her life. And she is changed and runs and tells the whole community about Jesus and who he is, and her life is completely changed. You think of the woman caught in adultery in uh, the Gospel of John, where the religious leaders are you know, about to stone her for committing adultery. And Jesus comes and draws a line in the sand and calls them all out, and they drop their stones and they leave. And what Jesus does with her is he doesn't say, hey, it's totally cool what you did, just keep on doing it. But he also doesn't condemn her. He says, go on and sin no more. He gives her like a new life, a new ability to live in the future with Christ and with a new identity and purpose. So whether you're a man or a woman, if you've been through divorce in the past, Jesus has a future for you. He has grace for you and hope for you. So if you're married, righteousness looks like commitment. Okay, here's our last one. Righteousness looks like telling the truth. Righteousness will look like being people who tell the truth in every situation, shoot straight, avoid spin and manipulation. Um, Jesus will talk about this by using something like talking about vows and oaths that we don't totally use today. Um, but we'll see what we can do to understand real quickly what he's talking about and apply it to us. I want to say this. If you have time and you want to listen to the Bible Project, uh, they've got an episode on this and divorce 45 minutes each so worth your time because uh, they dig into the hist history of it. Uh, it's insightful, illuminating, and encouraging. Just, I would go listen to that if I were you. 
And uh, if I mess it up here, they can correct it there. So tell the truth. Um, this is what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 33 through 36. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to, to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oath to the Lord. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, because it's God's throne, or by the earth, because it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. Do not even swear by your own head, because you cannot make a single hair white or black. Here's possibly what Jesus is doing here. Um, originally, oaths and vows, you can find them all over the Old Testament, was a way for an Israelite to say, hey, I'm gonna live by my word. I swear by the God of heaven that I will do it. Now, over time, just like we do with other commandments, an oath can be used to sort of communicate intent when you don't really intend it. And your word might be uh, bolstered because of an oath, but you really don't have the desire inside to carry it out like you are saying you are. And so some historians say that what happened was people started to get loose with their oaths. In fact, they stopped using the name of God to respect it, and they started to, to take oaths by things that were adjacent to God. Like they take an oath and they would, you know, I vow this on the temple. Or as Jesus would say here, uh, you know, I, I, I take this vow, um, you know, in the name of heaven. Or I take this vow because, uh, you know, according to God's throne. Or I take this vow on my own head. And then when they don't carry out the promise, they're like, well, I didn't really take the vow in God's name. I did it in the name of heaven. Or I did it, you know, in the name of my own head. And it's a way of getting out of commitment. So really what people are doing is they're, they're using oaths to manipulate people. And Jesus is saying, stop doing that. First of all, Heaven is mine. The throne of David is mine. Your own head is mine. And so when you take vows on those things, you're usually, you're like literally using my name and you're committing a lie to people. Stop doing that. Say what you mean and intend and, and, intend and do it. Don't overpromise. Don't commit to what you cannot do. Don't bend reality like we often do to get people to think a certain way and get something from someone. That's manipulation and lying. Tell the truth. Jesus cares that his disciples in the world and all of our relationship with people tell the truth. In fact, if you cannot tell the truth, you will not live in right relationship with people. I think we all have examples of how that's happened in our lives. Truth telling is, is sort of the baseline of what you need to build right relationships and trust with other people. And Jesus wants us to be people who tell the truth. In fact, he says this in verse 37. He says, instead of taking oaths and vows like this, just let your yes mean yes. And let your no mean no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. Just be honest. Shoot straight. He says, if you want to lie, you're lining yourself up with the evil one, Satan. And we can read throughout scripture on how Satan is the father of lies from the very first pages of scripture. In the words of Buddy the Elf, Satan sits on a throne of lies, if you know the reference there. And when we, when we lie and, and push lies in our life, we are lining up not with the king of kings, but with the, with the one who sits in the throne of lies. And Jesus says, just don't do it. Be honest. Be honest at work. Be honest at home. Be honest at church. Be honest in your relationship with people. Be honest with yourself. Don't lie. It doesn't do any good. It does not bring right relationships. I want to take just a, a second to encourage us as a church, especially as we enter into an election cycle. In fact, we're already in an election cycle. That the words of Jesus here are just super important for us to remember at all times, whether you're watching the news, engaging on social media, or in conversations with people. Be a people who line up with the truth. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. All of us have a responsibility as Christians living in America to do our civic duty and our political duty. I would not tell you who to vote for. Um, you get to do that. Use your conscience. Use the scripture. Vote how you're going to vote. Engage in politics in a way that brings health into your relationships and other people. But here's what I would hope for us as Christians, especially here at Bethel, that once you vote or decide on who you're going to vote on, be really, really careful with how much you take things that you hear in the media or from other people and share those as truth with other people. Um, and, and again, I'm not picking on one side or the other. It's, hap like it's politics and it's politicians. There are lies happening. 
Uh, we'd be crazy to think there wasn't. And what can happen sometimes is we go beyond our civic duty and we start to like fight on behalf of different parties and we start to take things we're hearing and push them on other people. And we might be getting caught up in lies when we do that. And here's why it's important. It's important for one, personally, uh, that sometimes we can get so far deep into things that are not true that we start not even realizing what's true and what's not true. And that's not good as a Christian. We wanna know what is true and we wanna talk about what's true. But here's something that's just as important, that when we're people who don't line up with the truth, we actually do damage to the credibility of Jesus to the watching world. So if we're, you know, I believe in Jesus, he's the king of kings, he died for my sins, you should believe him too, and then people see us on social media or in our lives, just like channeling things that are just conspiracy theories or things that just may not actually be true, they're like, I don't know if I can believe you. Like if I were to tell you right now, stand up here and tell you like, I believe in Bigfoot, I did go to church with a guy on the West side who swears he saw Bigfoot. So I'm not picking on those people. Maybe I would like Bigfoot to be real, but I believe in Bigfoot. I think the earth is flat and you know, some of their conspiracy theory, like I don't think the Holocaust happened. Question for you. How much would you trust any other opinion I might share with you on anything? You probably wouldn't. You'd be like, yeah, Adam believes some weird things. There's not a conspiracy theory that Adam doesn't love. In fact, he just all believes they're true. That happens with us when we are holding on to Jesus and we're channeling things that are not true. So when it comes into this next five to six months, I, I would love to see us as a church. Just be careful to filter what we say, to filter what we take and share and to keep our eyes on Jesus, to vote, to do our thing, but to leave it there and not to join in in, in the things that are gonna be happening around us, but to be people who tell the truth and love the truth. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, yeah, it's, a, it's... So concluding here, I've got one minute. I'm gonna try to do this real quick. Uh, whether it's our thoughts or marriage or telling the truth, Jesus is calling us to a greater righteousness in all of them. Um, not looking for loopholes, not looking for an ability to sort of sidestep around commands, but to live righteously both with the commands and our heart's intent to truly obey them. A simple obedience from the heart. Not because you're earning God's love, not so you can go show people how awesome you are, but so that you can live in right relationship with God and with the people around us. And what's amazing about the work of Jesus is he has done the work on the cross and in his resurrection to actually make this possible in your life everybody's life, no matter how far you might be from God, how far deep you are into sin, maybe it's sexual sin and lust, maybe it's a broken marriage, maybe it's that you literally cannot tell the truth in your life, wherever you might be, Jesus has the power to change you. Um, I wanted to share this verse from Romans chapter eight, uh, where Paul is talking about how the law, though it was good, couldn't change people. And really what the law did is it exacerbated the sin in us because we're sinful and we want to obey the law and we can't. And Paul says, Jesus did something on the cross to take care of that. He condemned sin, killed sin, and then by the spirit he's raised and he starts pouring that work into us so we can actually begin to fulfill the law like Jesus did. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 8. For what the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. The law was supposed to kill sin. Well, it didn't. But Jesus condemned sin in the flesh by sending, or God did, uh, by sending his son in the likeness of our sinful flesh as a sin offering. And this is why. In order that the law's requirements wouldn't just go away, wouldn't become unimportant, but would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The Spirit of God is available to every single disciple, old and new, to help you begin to live like Jesus in your life. And what that means for us is to yield, to be honest, to be humble, to see the places where we're not living according to God's standard and to say, Lord, like I, I confess and I repent and I open myself to the work of your Spirit. Will you help me to live in the way that you have called me to live? So this morning, if you are outside of Jesus if you don't know him yet, then I encourage you to run to him. He doesn't need you to bring your righteousness, your good works to him. He wants to love you and forgive you and give you his righteousness and then begin to change your life to live as his kingdom people in the world. If you are a disciple of Jesus already, 
I want us to remember what Jesus did to kill sin and unleash his powerful grace in our lives so that we can be a kingdom people in a world that needs it. And so for you, I just want to leave you with this. Uh, If the Lord is tugging on you, and even maybe through these verses we've been looking at this morning, challenging you in a specific place where you can deepen your righteousness, turn to Jesus. Give him the opportunity to do that in your life, to love you and forgive you and begin to change you because Jesus loves you enough. He does not want you to stay who you are. He died to change you and give you a new life. And so I hope we'll respond to that this morning and, and live in the righteousness that Jesus calls us to. All right, would you pray with me? Uh, Jesus, we thank you that you um, are a good king and that all these things that you have called us to, you have already done them yourself. You have already lived them out perfectly and faithfully for us. And Jesus, I pray this morning that for all of us in this room, we would heed your voice and lean on you to help us become these kind of people. Not self-righteous, not working for your love, but living out of who you are and what you're doing in our lives. Jesus, make us more like you. Center our life on you. And Lord, keep our focus on you. We pray this in your name uh, for your glory alone. Amen. Amen. Well, before we begin to worship, uh, we're going to take a minute to reflect. I don't know about you, but there was a lot of of truth and and, uh, great things that Adam just shared. And so I find that oftentimes in our lives, we move quickly from one thing to the next, from meeting to meeting at work, or if you've got kids, from diapers to naps to tantrums and, and all of the things that come after each other. And so before moving on too quickly, let's just take a minute to reflect, to pray, Uh, and to just meditate on what the Lord has to say through Adam's words um, and center ourselves before we begin to worship through song. So we're going to stand and worship through song this morning. And I just want to encourage us, um, in in the words of Psalm 1, it says, uh, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, uh, but, but delights in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. And I think one of the beautiful things about worship through song is that songs get stuck in our head. And we leave, and they're stuck in our head throughout the week. And so my hope for this song is that we leave this place um, and not forget what the Lord spoke and how the Lord spoke, but that this song uh, just kind of becomes the anthem for our week um, and just gets stuck in our head. So let's sing this.
thoughts. We want to be in committed relationships and want to be truth seekers. Hey, if you're joining us online, I forgot to say good morning to you. So good morning to you. Uh, we would love to see you uh, sometime. Um, and for whether you're here online or in person, we hope you are blessed today uh, by worship, by the message, maybe just being around a large group of people and believers. I want to point out off to my left, um, we have our prayer team. And if you wanted to approach the throne and talk to God with someone, um, there's someone waiting over there. We'd love to do that with you. This morning, we just want to leave you with um, some of God's words from Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Maybe the Spirit is having you step into the foyer today and join us in small groups. And maybe it's just going to call you back so we can see you next week. But either way, have a great Sunday.